Okay, thank you very much. It's time to hear from the, our audience, and I think uh, we've got somebody who's going to pass the mic around. I think that's a really important comment, and, and I don't know that, um, you know, university administration or, or how we budget our, our internationalization activities really takes it into account enough. Because why do students, why are students coming to university? It's to learn. So, again, coming back to fac the faculty member's role in the classroom is so critically important. And just by having students rub shoulders together, it's, it's not an osmosis thing. There has to be some more intentionality around it. And yet, are faculty members equipped to understand and know how to use it within their own discipline? Like, how do they bring that in, right? How can they really not, um, you know, I think it has, you have to be careful, too, about how you, how you introduce it in the classroom, but um, we just need an awful lot more awareness and training and maybe professional development for our faculty. Uh, yes, I really am enjoying this discussion. Uh, my name is Roger Todd. I'm currently a sessional lecturer at the University of Manitoba. And having recently retired, I suddenly find myself starting a new career, sort of a new career. I've been teaching part-time in the past. But uh, one thing I noted in teaching international relations, for example, during this past last summer, I noted an awful lot of international students there, many of which were having a lot of trouble with their English so, Ray, I certainly appreciated your particular comments with regards to uh, English language capability. Uh, many students, I think, were finding themselves a little bit demoralized by the fact that they really weren't uh, on par with the, you know, the, the native uh, English speakers. And uh, so there was a bit of a challenge there. Um, it reminded me of when I was a student in Germany and uh, was very hesitant to get myself involved in graduate study, at graduate level um, seminars, because I didn't think my German was really adequate for that. And so I did take, I, I did concentrated my time while I was there on, uh, on what they call Deutsch für Ausländer, uh, German for foreign, for foreign speakers, uh, and spent a lot of time reading German material, really focusing on my German vocabulary and uh, now, as I observe, you know, the students here, I'm really recognizing, you know, I, I feel for them because I was kind of in, this, in their shoes uh, myself, you know, when I was a student overseas. Uh, I was also doing the TESOL um, practicum, you know, the teaching English as a second language uh, at, in the intensive English program at the University of Manitoba a few years ago. And I was really somewhat moved, I suppose, by the demoralization of many of the foreign students who just could not, you know, get, uh, acquire English competency as fast as they would have liked to, and they just kept failing and failing, and they felt, in, in some cases, really quite hopeless. So uh, I think that what you pointed out, Ray, I think the importance of having adequate language, English language ability is really important uh, before the students kind of get thrown in at the deep end, basically. And, and I, I appreciate that good comment, and, and uh, I know the others will, will have uh, something to say on this as well. Uh, you know, certainly one thing, a uh, further observation that I would just add to that is that, you know, there's a difference between individuals who legitimately and, and fully prepare and, and achieve a, a result uh, on, a, on a language test in an overseas setting and then come directly into an educational setting versus the kinds of, of diverse strategies that are needed to, to create um, effective integration into the post-secondary environment. And, and that's certainly where we're focused is creating multiple streams for individuals using English for specific purposes, looking at specific uh, various modules that would tailor uh, to different programs so that not every student who's coming into um, you know, a carpentry program would have the same approach. Carpentry is a bad example, we don't, uh, it's not long enough to qualify, but coming into our, one of our electrical programs or uh, would be very different from someone going into a health program. So uh, there, there is a very unique uh, nature to, to the different programs as well as the individuals coming in and a need to tailor strategies once, once they're here. Yeah, I think the language piece is, um, is really challenging. You've outlined the, that challenge well. Um, 
the thing is, what, universities are competing with each other for students. So if universities raise the entry level too high, there's sort of killing one of their competitive advantages. So the universities have to play this um, balancing act on like how much is enough to get in. Um, and whatever that amount is, it's not enough. And they, the key point is they really need that support once they're in, because even a student coming in, um, you know, on a IELTS score is the, one of the standard scores, a 6.5 IELTS, um, they're doing well, but they're, I mean, they're nowhere near a proficient level of English. So um, this expectation that students are gonna come into university with perfect English and be able to have the same English level as a native speaker is one of the challenges. Right? And one of the challenges universities post-secondary have to address is if we want to do international, how do we support those students when they come in as opposed to letting them flail about for a few years? Um, I think I would add as well uh, to the language um, issue is the understanding of the higher education it's system itself. What are our rules, regulations? What do we consider academic honesty, academic integrity? Yeah, because those are often very culturally bound culturally understood and there's there's a yeah a whole set of learning that um, that the students need to undergo when they come to Canada. Yeah and just one more point on that is there's the student component but they want to get in as fast as possible. <laughs> you know? And so they want to just meet the minimum bar often to get in without realizing, you know what, if I take an extra six months at the front end, it's gonna make my life easier for the next four years or however long they're studying. But it's it's human nature we want to get there as fast as we can. Marlene Atley of um, uh, University of Manitoba Education. And it's exciting to see uh, a lot of students here, a lot of ex-students, which is really great. I uh, want to make some four po uh, make four points uh, and, and let each of you that feel called to speak on them. One is, um, I think it was Gary that said, you know, we really don't have any idea uh, that the average person, the public, really has no idea of the demographics we're looking at in terms of school closures, in terms of the Canadian demographics that we have here and how we actually need, um, we need settlers, <laughs> and continuing settlers, different kinds of settlers. So that's fun. The other one is just the very conservative nature of the university and, and how, how much work it does, how much time it, and energy it takes for institutional change, real institutional change, and again, that's usually generational. I think we forget that many Canadians have only been here for sort of one generation. And why would they want to go back to the trauma and the heartache that they came from one or two generations ago? It doesn't make sense. It's a refuge here. And so we really need to understand that history of uh, many families. Uh, why would they want to do that? And that's the kind of thing that we're really not looking at. But I think one of the major things is that we're still working with our language programming, with TESOL and those kinds of programming. We're still working on a model of, um, of assimilation of second language speakers into Canada. I'm an L2. I've been an L2 for most of my life, right? Um, but the thing is, as a Canadian, I know the difference between speaking to an immigrant as an L2 and inviting them to be an L1. And the L1 and L2 has to do with whether you're a native speaker or not. And this becomes really important in the classroom. So the difference between an immersion program where you're welcoming people into the classroom or if you're teaching them Tesla kind of programming where you're bringing them in as a foreigner and they will forever be foreigners, they will never be L1s. And I think that is, uh, it, it really is, uh, is stymieing to the student because they never understand it, and also to the instructors because they really don't understand what they're doing to students, what we're doing to students. If we really want people to become Canadians, we really need to look at our English as a second language programming and understanding what we are in fact doing because uh, unless we start looking at some of those assumptions like with the language benchmarks and the citizenship pieces that come in there, we really don't know that we're in fact alienating them at some levels before we're even bringing them on board. So there's quite a bit to look at if we really want to do this well. Thank you. I, 
Well, I, I guess to, to comment on, on that, Marnie, um, I, I, it brings me back to the fact that the international students that we're bringing in, we have to allow them to change us, too. It's, it, it's not just about assimilation, it's about us all becoming globally aware, uh, the students as well as us. Just on the language uh, and, and other assimilation comments, I mean, I, I would say that, that, you know, we need to create a space for both authentic Canadian experiences as well as authentic international experiences on both sides. And, and you know, certainly see that, uh, you know, uh, where there are barriers for international students when they go to workplaces and, you know, they, they have a challenge in terms of making those kinds of connections. It's not dissimilar, dissimilar from other, uh, from other uh, individuals and uh, from different backgrounds. Um, Aboriginal students, other people that are that are facing it's not the same, but it's but there are similarities to some of the barriers that ones would face in those in those instances. And uh, I think from an institutional perspective, trying to be as supportive as possible to create uh, you know the meaningful dialogues that you're speaking of are, is is critically important. And, and I would like to go back to your first comment about the demographics and how little we actually know ourselves. I think that. Um, you know, one of the things that study abroad does is it disrupts some of the assumptions that we have about ourselves. It makes us more self-aware. And and I think that that's something that in Manitoba, maybe we're just, like you say, too comfortable, or, you know, we just haven't really thought of it from that perspective before. Who are we? And then, because we have to answer that before we can ask what are our needs, you know, like, like says, what, what do you want to accomplish by bringing students here? Is it? So, yeah, I think that's a pretty fundamental question. As one of Marlene's students, I feel compelled to speak. <laughs> um, uh, my name is Robin Rokhenke. I work at University of St. Boniface. I'm the coordinator of the international office there. Um, and um, having studied in this field for quite a while now, um, when I saw this, the title of the presentation tonight, Internationalization, it's much more than study abroad. We're all, so far, we've only talked about study abroad. And as you said, what's the percentage of your students that go abroad? It's, it's, less, it's less for us. Um, but what we always focus on at our university is the fact that almost 50% of our students were born outside of Canada. And that is an extremely diverse population that we have. And we need to know who we are and why have they come to us to have this experience that's called post-secondary. We have both college and university. And all of those discussions happen in the hallways, in the cafeterias, amongst ourselves, with staff, with the students. And we need to remember that we were once welcomed here, even if it was, in my case, five generations ago. And we need to remember that the welcoming that happened on this territory before my family was here has now been gifted to us. And that's part of what we now want to share and we want to learn, and I think we already are very, very diverse in our primary schools and our secondary schools, and so part of us have already traveled a lot without having left Winnipeg. And so we don't necessarily need to go to places that are unicultural, because that is very foreign to us. That's not who we are as Manitobans. Um, and so what I think universities need to focus on is learning more about who we are when we're coming into class, and learning more about what we're calling internationalization at home. Because even if we do as well as Germany, 70% of the people are still gonna stay home. So how are those 70% of people going to feel this internationalization? And in Manitoba, we can do that just by being ourselves. So we just have to open up to that idea, I think, and say, wait a minute, we're already super diverse. We, and it's a great privilege, I think, that we can talk to the Germans and the Polish and the different Ojibwe, whichever, and we can already learn a lot without traveling. And as post-secondary institutions, how do we capture that? So that could be interesting to examine as well. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think, Rob, it, it really requires intentionality. I keep thinking about you know, a frog in a pot of water, right? You know? <laughs> we're, we're so immersed in the multiculturalism that we have a lot of assumptions about it that kind of need to be, you know, broken down and <laughs> kind of examined a little bit and then learned, yeah.
thanks for the question. Uh, the court doesn't uh, does address research, but not, not probably not as deeply as, as you, you 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 would like. Uh, certainly, the focus is on sort of rec reciprocity and, and, and an understanding of different perspectives and uh, temptation, you know, resisting the temptation to move into international settings in a neo-colonial uh, kind of way. Uh, the, the discrepancy between North and South isn't really addressed in the, in the accord, uh, as, as you would have, you probably would prefer. So it doesn't really go into that quite that detail. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a good question, but I think the strength we have in Canada is that we have a strong public university education system. That's not the same around the world. Um, in a lot of countries, if you want good education, you go to the private providers. So I think we're starting in Canada from a, pro a position of strength. I think it's something we have to be aware of. Um, but I think we value education in Canada too much to uh, allow any sort of... Um, uh, maybe I'm being naive, but to allow any sort of degradation of the quality of our education services because we have we, we value it so much in Canada. And, and that shows through our public funding of our uh, universities and post-secondary education and our, you know, K to 12. You know, in Canada, if, you know, we see international families coming in and they want to know where the good private school is. And you know, my answer, and you know, I have a bias because I was a public school trustee, but I say, well, go to the publics there. You know, <laughs> that's where the good education is in Canada. It's all good because you know we, we monitor it. But so I think we're starting from a position of strength. So I'm not sure it's that much of a worry. Uh, again, there's a lot of great private providers that are doing really innovative things out there. So I don't think we can discount private providers just because they're private and they're for profit. And this is going to be a provocative statement but there's a lot of people making money in public education. Um, superintendents in Winnipeg School Divisions all make around $200,000 a year. I wish I was paying myself that as a private provider. You know, and again, I mean, I'm not you know, trying to <laughs> create problems here, but the reality is, is that this idea that as soon as something's private and it's driven by profit, therefore it must be bad. I, I, don't, I, I think we have to challenge that assumption. Hi, uh, I'm Robert Mitzi. I'm at the Faculty of Education as well with David. Hi, David. Um, I, I'd like to just point out I'm currently having, I'm, I'm coordinating a research project with uh, provincial schools that are overseas, and I have four provinces participating in this research project, and there are two tensions I've noticed, and I'd like to hear your, your response. One of these tensions is that the public-private divide, school administrators are being trained in Canada with the public good of, a lead for social justice, and they're and they're going over overseas and having to learn business plans and strategies for economic development, things that are very uncommon in the current leadership pr preparation programs. Second tension is Canadian teachers are uh, um, see themselves teaching in a Canadian school overseas, and they therefore teaching in a Canadian way, and they don't quite understand the whole um, value of community within that piece. And so I'd like to hear your responses on those two pieces of tension and whether that's ever appeared in some of your work, uh, and as well as, and, and just a greater um, understanding of policy consultation process and how perhaps if we were to be a bit more proactive at, at addressing the tensions in the work around internationalization, how does the, your agencies involve the public and the different types of stakeholders we're talking about here in, in developing policy that, that responds to some of the tensions and some of their experiences. Um, I guess my initial response is wait five or 10 years, all of that business practice stuff, it's coming. <laughs> we're gonna have to learn it here in Canada as well. Um, yeah, I think that there are a lot of tensions in internationalization. I'd like to go back to a comment that Robin made about how internationalization is so much more than student mobility. I think it is, you know, as you, as you read earlier, Ray, it, it's a cornerstone, but there's much, much more to it. And uh, we need to critically reflect on our structures, our systems, um, uh, 
the, the academic tenure and promotion system, the, it, you know, it, it's all part of the mix. It's not just certain different activities. So how do they all work together? Um, I think your, your latter question was, you know, how do you involve the grassroots, right, in a meaningful way? And that's what we're, I guess I'll use the word experimenting with at the University of Manitoba, where we have a new international strategy. Uh, it's trying to give some kind of cohesion and direction um, to our, our international outlook. But really on an ongoing basis, how do we how do we listen to the voice of students, staff, and even community members who, who care, right? So we, I think we have a fairly innovative structure with our regional advisory groups where anybody, can, anybody in, within the university community can join one of these regional advisory groups and it has a, kind of a, a structured way of reporting up to our international advisory committee and influences our senior decision makers. That's just within the university. How do we do it as a, as a wider community? You know, I don't know, maybe others have, have other ideas on that, but yeah. I, on the, uh, I guess on the engagement side, I mean, I agree it's, it's critically important. Um, you know, there are various opportunities in life of any organization to, to undertake this kind of activity. A um, couple examples that, I, that come to the top of mind, certainly for MITT, is you know our, our, our campus master planning processes. We plan our spaces. We try to create culturally sensitive places for our international students. You know we have an internet. We have a, a community consultation process that is that is a, a part of that, which is focused on you know bringing people together to um, you know to assist in, in providing us with some guidance and direction. Um, you know, we consider our employers as part of the community. I mean, they're, they're the ones that are taking our, our students for jobs. So our advisory committees and councils that we have with various employers and sectors would be, again, another area where, you know, where we can sort of drive, uh, you know, some level of, of engagement with the broader community and work to ensure that our international students, when they ultimately do land with these employers, whether it be for practicum or for ultimately employment, are, are able to land in a place of, uh, you know where they can uh, feel comfortable and, and be able to to uh, work uh, as part of the you know uh, the broader fabric of, of the province. So I think that that's uh, you know a couple examples from us on, on the community side. 